got this weird idea in their head that all they have to do is get all the right chemicals together and then add energy and it'll make life. Okay, well, let's do an experiment. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. In a matter of moments, you will have frog nog. <laughs> and you will have all of the chemicals required to make a frog in one blender, right? Then we're going to add energy. You can turn it on puree for 30 minutes. You can nuke it, microwave it, zap it with jumper cables. I don't care what you do. Drop a hand grenade in there. Add all the energy you want, okay? How long will it take to reassemble the frog? It'll never happen. See, just getting the chemicals together isn't the problem. Let's put this grotesque and idiotic idea into perspective. This is a 55 Chevy Bel Air, a fine example of intelligent design. But if we put it in a car crusher and squish it into a cube, then you'd have all the metal, rubber, and other materials to build this car. How long would it take to reassemble it? It'll never happen because that's not the way cars are built, and it's not the way they're repaired either. You go to the mortuary, you got a dead body laying there, you got all the chemicals required for life right there in one spot. Bring it back to life. The disconnect between those who understand evolution and those who reject the science to make believe in supernatural miracles, i.e. magic, instead, is that the wanna believers imagine everything being orchestrated from the top down by the order of some mystical administrator, when actually most patterns in nature are emergent from the bottom up, being formed incrementally from or by constituent components according to a number of different processes. It take, for example, an ant farm. You know that all these intricate interconnecting branches were formed from the inside by a colony of ants, none of whom are individually aware of the pattern they're collectively constructing. Now instead of crushing the 55 Chevy, let's crush the ant farm, so that not only do we collapse all the tunnels they're in, but we crush all the ants too. And then the preacher challenges you to rebuild the ant farm, not to let ants rebuild it the way only ants can do. They can't anymore because they're all dead. Instead, the preacher wants you to do it. And how could anyone at our size possibly recreate that ant colony? We are too big and clumsy for that. And we can build cars easily enough where ants can't. But the patterns we see in nature, like the tunnels in an ant colony, are not intelligently designed. They are emergent, incidental designs, far beyond what our fat fingers could manage even with the tiniest tweezers. It doesn't have to be the work of smaller forms of life, either. There are constantly recurring molecular processes that can do much the same thing with staggering detail, literally without a thought. Some things are simply the result of chemistry and energy. Such is life itself, emerging from a series of molecular processes. As physicist Jeremy England put it, life is a dissipation-driven adaptation that given the chemical conditions of this world and presumably others like it, that life is an inevitable result of the laws of thermodynamics. And the famous mathematician Benoit Mendelbrot added to this thought, saying that bottomless wonders spring from simple rules which are repeated without end. But creationists cannot or will not even allow themselves to comprehend the concept of emergence, because they need to imagine that there is a purpose behind it all and a person in charge, someone they can plead with whenever they need a wish granted, even if it means that 2 plus 2 equal 5 on a specific occasion. Creationists are like Karen, demanding to speak with the manager of the universe. It's foolish to believe that everything has agency. And even if you believe that there's no such thing as coincidence and that everything happens because some playwright in the clouds has decided that it should, that's not really a lot different than thinking that there must be a tiny band of musicians living inside your radio. Life is something different. I don't think science has ever defined that clearly. But was this preacher homeschooled? Did he never attend a secular middle school wherein he should have been taught the most basic definition of life, being one or more cells with metabolism, homeostasis, and some means of respiration that responds to its environment and can grow, reproduce, and evolve? How can this preacher speak about biology with such authority when he doesn't even have an eighth grade understanding of it? And he thinks nobody else does either. They talk about how we all came from this early life form. Once this first life form got started, this single cell, then it evolved into everything else. Like this textbook shows the kids that a bacteria slowly evolved to a human. These trees of life are absolute propaganda. 
There is no evidence for any of these, okay? The evidence there really is for these is detailed and extensive, spanning all through paleontology, embryology, and of course, genetics. For the last quarter of a century or so, I've been offering a challenge to creationists that I could effectively prove evolution even to their satisfaction using taxonomy. And usually creationists flee from that challenge like cockroaches when you turn the kitchen light on. But a couple dozen times, I've happened across someone who thinks they can bullshit their way through this. And the challenge is that within a couple dozen mutual exchanges, they would admit that evolution is real and they'd be embarrassed at ever having believed in creationism. The only trick is they cannot repeatedly ignore direct points or queries because this has to be a Socratic interaction wherein I have to explain the basics and get them to acknowledge their understanding of that before we move on to the next level. But with only one exception, everyone who has ever accepted that challenge has defaulted and always the same way by refusing to answer simple yes or no questions like, do you accept the scientific data presented so far? And if not, why not? Because creationism is all about make-believe. It's not about learning the truth, it's about pretending to know it already, even if you already know that it's wrong, but you're determined to believe it anyway. So I ask questions that establish what the person already knows, and they realize immediately how they're painting themselves into a corner, and they're forbidden to admit when they're wrong. And the only questions they ask me are the ones they, they think I don't have an answer to, because they don't want to know the answer. They want to think that if I don't know the answer, then they're free to believe whatever they want so they will not engage in good faith. The one exception, the one time a creationist ever did take this challenge sincerely, she was teaching creation in a Christian school. Then she accepted evolution and became a science teacher in a public school. She then went on to get a master's degree in science writing and she writes curriculum now. She also married me. The point is that the preacher is the one whose entire career is about spreading propaganda that is not supported by any evidence. These taxonomic trees are a demonstrable reality, and we really can prove that through an overwhelming preponderance of evidence beyond reasonable doubt, though that requires some education because it is so in-depth. People like this preacher simply don't know what they don't know. They don't know how much they don't know, and they don't want to either. Even Mary Leakey said, those trees of life with the branches of our ancestors, that's a lot of nonsense, okay? I can find no record of this quote outside of a reporter's comment after she died. I suspect that this may be like the Lady Hope hoax when a Christian nurse claimed that Darwin had recanted his theory on his deathbed, a claim that was strongly refuted by a few of Darwin's children who also said that Lady Hope was never even there and that the story was simply fabricated. I don't know if Mary Leakey ever said that, and I doubt if she did, because I talked to her son, Richard Leakey, several years ago, and he told me that the creationist movement is led by a dishonest bunch of operators of astonishing stupidity, and that misquotation is the hallmark of their work. Hey, Stephen Gould said the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils, that's for sure. Even when the scientist actually said the quote in question, it is still deceptively misrepresented. When Stephen Jay Gould said this nearly half a century ago, there were very few transitional species yet known, some important ones like Archaeopteryx lithographica and Australopithecus afarensis, both predicted by Darwin himself, but there were not many others. The preacher omitted Gould's reference to the few transitional species we already had back then because he doesn't want you to know that we ever had any at all, and not that it matters because in the last 30 or 40 years or so, We've seen a paleontological boon in transitional species, filling nearly every gap since then. And the preacher also misread the remainder of Gould's quote, not understanding that ever since the days of Carolus Linnaeus, when no fossils were yet known, that taxonomy was determined by comparative morphology, and it still is, with the recent addition of genomics, of course. What Linnaeus could already demonstrate even in his own time, we can prove conclusively now. There is no evidence that any animal is related to any other kind of animal. There is indisputable evidence of the relationships between mammals at several taxonomic levels. What there is no evidence for at all is what the preacher refers to as a kind. Originally, the Hebrew word min meant the same thing as the modern biological species concept, meaning whether two individuals were related closely enough that they could still interbreed and produce fertile offspring. 
But when creationists realized that speciation had been directly observed and confirmed too many times to deny, then they tried to redefine kinds in order to move the goalposts to some higher but ambiguously undefined level so that they would never have to admit when they're wrong. For example, the Bible mentions the cattle kind, but fails to limit that only to the things that can bring forth. Yet, even though this preacher knows that a lot of these things that are universally accepted as cattle cannot interbreed, he still calls them the same kind. Except when he realizes how far that goes and that there's no way to divide them, because even the Bible refers to sheep and goats as cattle, as if all of these things are the same kind. And he can't contradict that without contradicting himself as well as the Bible too. But this textbook says, All the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. There's no such thing as a primitive unicellular organism. If it's alive, it's complicated. This is the fallacy of moving goalposts again. Unicellular organisms are by definition simpler than multicellular life, and prokaryotes are simpler than even the simplest eukaryote microbes. And remember that the preacher makes the mistake of thinking that complexity implies design, when an intelligent designer would have made things much more efficiently than what we see throughout biology. And unless he is the author of confusion, then God wouldn't have made everything look exactly like everything was related. We'll cover more on that in a minute. And then it says, no traces of those events remain. The textbook is referring to fossils of transitional microbes, which we have no reasonable expectation of ever finding. Big things fossilize easier than little ones, and you usually need hard parts like shells or bones, whereas these transitions are squishy and microscopic. Even still, we have more evidence of them than we do for creationism. What they do is they tell the kids, okay kids, the mammals, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. That's easy enough to demonstrate too, just with the Sesame Street game of One of these things is not like the others. Understand that all of these are animals. And more than that, they're chordates. And what kind of chordates? They're vertebrates. More than that, they're all tetrapods. And even more specifically, they're all amniotes, meaning that unlike fish or amphibians, these all develop in an amniotic egg. Even the mammal. The fact that mammals came from eggs was discovered by a Russian embryologist in 1827. And that sets this one apart, doesn't it? I mean, Birds and mammals are both warm-blooded, but apart from that, birds have a lot more in common with crocodiles, including features in the skeleton and circulatory system, and even the hard shells of their eggs. Whereas, once people used to think that, that mammals and birds and reptiles were all equally different, the discovery of dinosaurs bridged the gap between crocodilians and birds, putting both into the same category. Birds and crocodiles are both diapsids, where mammals are synapsids, and more than that, they're both archosaurs, more closely related to each other than either is to, say, lizards. And we'll get a lot more into that in an upcoming episode. They draw these trees in the books, and they look so pretty, and the kid goes, Wow, they've got proof. I saw it in my book. <laughs> no, they've got a picture in your book, okay? This is a picture of an atom. If you're going to teach atomic theory, the idea that all matter is composed of atoms and that atoms are the smallest unit of any element that retains the chemical properties of that element, then you have to include illustrations. Even though there are millions of atoms on every page, and even the period at the end of any given printed sentence includes millions of atoms in ink, you still have to include an illustration so that the kids can tell what you're talking about. I don't think even this preacher would say that atomic theory is just a theory, as if atoms might not even be real. And likewise, if you're going to teach math, you need to devise numerals to represent quantities and symbols explaining what to do with these quantities. But even though math can only be demonstrated with these illustrations, that doesn't mean that it isn't real. <laughs> we can demonstrate that it is. The same goes for geography. You have to show pictures of states and countries represented by the shape of their borders. Are you going to pretend that even if those borders aren't physically there, that those states or countries don't have any political or legislative reality? So if we're going to talk about millions of data points connecting different breeds of domestic dogs to different species of wild dogs and foxes and so on, even the ones that can no longer interbreed and are therefore by definition a different kind of canid or carnivoran or whatever, and we want to know their genetic pedigree, then we're going to have to be provided some illustrations. Everything inside that circle is pure religious speculation. They think it happened, they hope it happened, but there is zero evidence for anything inside that circle. It's one of the lies you're going to have to face in your textbook. 
We don't hope that evolution happened. There's no reason to hope for that. A religious faith may be all about hoping to see things not seen, imagining things to be the way you want them to be and refusing to believe that they could be anything else. But science is quite the opposite of all that. And this preacher and I have had this conversation before. <clears throat> Probably so the kind indicates somewhere around the family or genus level. Everything above that is speculation. If you want to believe this proves this, you're crazy. In my humble, totally unbiased opinion. Is it speculation that we belong to kingdom animalia? Because the definition of that clade is any multicellular organism with an internal digestive tract to ingest and digest other organisms in order to survive. If it describes you, it defines you. And that definition does describe humans, doesn't it? I mean, even your Bible says that humans are animals and that only our vanity would prevent us from recognizing or accepting this fact. Is it crazy to think that we are also in phylum chordata, meaning animals with a spinal cord? I mean, you do have a spinal cord, right? Is it just crazy speculation that you're also in class mammalia? Or can that be objectively proven that you're a warm-blooded chordate with hair follicles and mammary glands? You might object to being classified in the order of primates, but is it just speculation that you're a hind leg dominant mammal with opposable thumbs and forward facing binocular eyes and fully enclosed eye sockets? What about being in the family hominoidea? Because that means humans and anything like humans. I mean, even you wouldn't argue that you're neither human nor like a human, right? Were any of the Linnaean ranks only speculation like you said? Of course, there are several more layers now than Linnaeus knew about. I'm sure you can't argue that we're in the domain eukarya, since all our cells, including our blood cells, at least initially, have a nucleus. In my video on the systematic classification of life, I've listed some 50 named clades between what you would call molecules all the way to man. And there are several unnamed clades in there too. So our taxonomy is quite a bit more in-depth and complex than you can imagine. As I mentioned in that clip, I did a video series on the systematic classification of life, and it spans 50 episodes about eight hours of viewing to cover just some of the volumes of evidence that really does exist for taxonomy.